television producers and publishers have discovered that sorcery sells. And they're capitalizing on this. And they are producing a vast array of movies and shows and books that all make witchcraft seem to be fun for kids. And I think that parents are naive when they see no connection between the popularity of Harry Potter and the popularity of real witchcraft. Revelation 18, 23 says, through sorcery, all nations were deceived. Welcome back. Thank you for sticking with me. This is part four of Hour of the Witch. Uh, we have talked about the controversial topic of witchcraft in the Bible. The first program was called Wicca Goes Mainstream. The second one was called the Harry Potter Wicca Connection. The third one was What's Wrong with Wicca. The fourth one now is called The Alternative, The Man with Scars. If you open your Bible to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verses 9 through 14, this is the classic biblical passage about occult practices and how God tells us that we should have nothing to do with them. It says in this verse that we should not learn to follow the abominations of the nations around us, and it mentions those who practice witchcraft. It talks about spells and those who are mediums, those who call up the dead, and, it's, and the Bible says that all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. And then in verse 14, it says that God has not appointed these things for you. God does not want us to be involved in witchcraft and spells and potions. That's what his, that's what his book says. Now, if you look at the very next verse, verse 15, says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet from among your midst, from your brethren, him shall you hear. Now, when you look at this carefully, what's happening is verses 9 to 14 talk about occult practices, and then verse 15, God specifically tells us that he wants us to listen to the one that he's going to raise up who is the prophet. And who, who is that? Who is this a, a prediction of? When you read the Bible and read the New Testament, it was definitely a prediction of the coming of Jesus Christ, of God's Messiah. This is something very important to understand, that there is no religion, there is no religion on, on planet Earth except for a biblical religion that teaches the concept of fulfillment of prophecy in history. The Bible says there again, Deuteronomy 18, 15, that God would raise up a prophet. If you study Hinduism, if you study Buddhism, if you study Islam and the Quran, and if you study Wicca witchcraft, there is no other religion on planet Earth that teaches prophecy and fulfillment in a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. There are many passages, there are actually hundreds in the Bible that predict the coming of someone to redeem the world. Probably the classic passage is found in the book of Micah, the Old Testament book of Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. And here it says that Bethlehem would be the place. You, Bethlehem, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one who is to be the ruler of Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. This passage tells us Specifically, and this was written 700 years before Jesus was born, that he would come, that he would be born in Bethlehem. There's another passage in the book of Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1, and then verse 5 and 6 and 7, that tells us that a child would be born, a child of love, a child who would be called Wonderful, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And it says that he would come from the area of Galilee and that the light would shine to the people in the darkness, the light from the coming one. And that's exactly where Jesus grew up. He lived in the, in the area of Nazareth, in the area of Galilee. There's another passage in the book of Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 9, that says at the end of his life, it says that the king would come into Jerusalem, that he would ride upon a donkey, that he would be lowly uh, riding upon the foal of a donkey. And that's exactly what happened. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. 
And at the end of his life, he came into Jerusalem on the donkey. And when you study the life of Jesus, point by point by point, you find the fulfillment of ancient prophecies that were written hundreds of years before he was even born. Probably the greatest passage in the Old Testament that describes the coming of the Messiah is in Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53, especially for a Jewish person, is very, very powerful. The whole chapter describes the coming of the Messiah, and here are some of these, some of these passages, some of these predictions. Verse 3 says that he would be despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Verse 5 says that he would be wounded for our transgressions. He would be bruised for our iniquities. Verse 6 says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Verse 9 tells us that at the end of his life, he would be uh, killed, he would make his soul an offering for sin, and then he would make his grave with the wicked, but with the rich in his death. And then verse 10 says, when you make his soul an offering for sin, after he dies, it says, then he will see his seed and the pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. So even after he dies, it says then he's going to see. He's going to see his seed. And that's a prediction of his resurrection. And when you read this passage carefully, it clearly predicts the coming of somebody who would suffer, who would be uh, buried with the rich. Jesus, after he died, he was placed in a rich man's tomb. And then early Sunday morning on the first day of the week, the Bible's uh, very clear that that the stone was rolled away and he came out of the grave. And as the scripture says, uh, he would see after his death, which is a description of his resurrection. All of this was perfectly fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And again, there is no other religion anywhere on the planet, neither Hinduism nor Buddhism nor Islam. Uh, there's no religion, not Wicca witchcraft, that has prophecies in one place fulfilled in another place hundreds of years later and that is what happened in the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you go down to Luke in the New Testament, and if you look at chapter 24, after Jesus rose, he met with his disciples. Luke chapter 24, verse 44. And then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was yet with you, that of all the things which were written must be fulfilled things which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And then he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission or forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem, and you are the witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Witchcraft claims to offer people power, but the real power, at least the power from God and not from the devil, comes from Jesus Christ and understanding the significance of his life, his death and burial and resurrection, and realizing that all of this is the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Wicca can't touch this. No religion can touch this. Only the Bible. And as we read in Deuteronomy chapter 18, God said, don't get involved in witchcraft and sorcery and spells. It says, listen to the prophet that I'm going to raise up. And when you look at history, he was born in Bethlehem, he went into Jerusalem on the donkey, he suffered in Gethsemane, he died, he was buried in the tomb of a rich man, he rose from the dead, he could see again, and he met with his disciples, and he said all of this is done in fulfillment of prophecy. Every single part of his life was perfectly fulfilled in this, in this book. And this is, this is unique only to Christianity. Uh, 25 years ago, I discovered this. I realized who Jesus was. I invited him to come into my life, and I have experienced the power, as it mentions there, the power of his gospel and of his message. And that's what I want for you, the power of God. Don't get involved in witchcraft and the occult. Only get involved with the safe power of Jesus Christ.
As I look back on my 45 years of living, I can say that there were three major events that completely changed me. Uh, the first one was when I became a Christian and accepted Jesus Christ into my heart. There's a picture on the screen of me, if you can believe that, in my BC days, uh, when I was probably about 18. You can see I'm flicking a lighter. Uh, my, I'm at my dad's, and I'm probably stoned out of my mind. So my life completely changed when I was 20 years old when I gave my life to Christ. That was the first big change. The second one was when I finally met and married the love of my life, and that uh, was when I married Kristen Renee Demarest, and she's now Kristen Renee Wahlberg. And there's a picture of our, of our wedding. Brings back a lot of memories. April 9, the year uh, 2000. Now, the third big event was when my, my baby was born, and here's a picture of Seth. Little Seth, oh, I just love him so much. He's just so cute. Seth Michael Wahlberg. Uh, Wicca witchcraft teaches that there is a power in the universe, there is a power in the earth, and that power is, is a neutral power. Let me read it to you right here. This book called The Truth About Witchcraft by Scott Cunningham. It's a modern book trying to clarify what witchcraft really teaches in the light of the big interest about Wicca today. It says here on page 39 that the power that is at work in folk magic is just that. It's just power. It is neither positive nor negative. It is neither good nor evil. It is the intention and goal of the magician working with that power that determines whether the energy is used for helpful or harmful ends. They believe there's just power, it's neutral, and if you tap into that power, you can channel it for good purposes, and that's why they believe in, in what's called white magic. And as we've, as we've already discussed in this uh, seminar, that that view of reality is just not true. The Bible does not teach that there is a neutral power out there. In fact, the Bible says there's two powers. There is the power of God and the power of the devil. And neither one of these powers are neutral. God is perfectly moral, and the devil is extremely sinister. As I look back at the birth of my, my baby, I don't think there's ever been an event that has ever hit me or come to me that has impressed me more with the personal nature of God than Seth Michael Wahlberg. Let me just quickly tell you, tell you the story took me 41 years to get married. I was a, a late bloomer, and uh, when I finally took the big plunge, I definitely wasn't ready for kids. I didn't want any little Wahlbergs running around. Uh, the thought scared me, too much responsibility. I didn't like the idea of changing diapers, smelly diapers. I was actually quite petrified of, of having a child, so we waited for a while. But finally, in December of the year 2004, uh, we discovered that my wife was expecting. What a shock. And I thought, okay, well, nine months, I've got to get ready. Nine months to get ready. His due date was August 16. And of course, you know, babies always come on time, right? They always come on time. Well, uh, that was, the, that was the, the scheduled date, July 16. Uh, the week, no, I'm sorry, August 16. The month before that, in July, I was... Uh, in Northern California at a, at a big gathering, SoCal, California, and I was holding a big seminar on Bible prophecy. And some of you remember this, and it was, it was Wednesday, July 21, and I was teaching about the seven years of tribulation. That was my topic. And right in the middle of my talk, all of a sudden, the TV monitors in front of me started flashing, labor now, labor now, labor now. Well, that was it. I got into my car, grabbed my things, and drove as quickly as I could, two and a half hours away, finally reached the hospital. Uh, we were there at the hospital all night. My wife was having some complications. The next day, they tried to induce labor, and that wasn't working, and so they decided to have a C-section that night, and Seth was coming out. Now, because of the complications, we didn't know how he was. We didn't know if he was healthy, if there had been any kind of damage or not, and it was rather a nerve-wracking for us. So the, the, the night finally came, and it was about 6 o'clock. She was ushered into the operating room, and, and I went in there, and a little while after she was prepared, there was nine attendants in the room plus the doctor. Four of them were behind me just in case I fainted. Uh, Dr. Thomas did the incision, and as I watched, to my absolute amazement, he said, push. And one of the attendants pushed down, and flying out of my wife came this little, little baby 
with uh, all 10 fingers and all 10 toes, and he went, ah, he just gave the big scream when he came out, and they laid him right next to me, and he was kicking and screaming and howling, and I looked at him, and I went over there, and I said, Seth, Seth, it's your daddy, it's your daddy. And all of a sudden, he stopped crying, and he put his hand on his mouth, and he just went like this. He started listening, because he had heard daddy's voice uh, before he was born. It was amazing. Well, when I looked at that little baby, and as I think about what has happened in the last six months, I mean, I can't even tell you. I'm just going to show you some of these pictures. These are some of my favorite slides, so I hope you like them like I do. I'm sure you can as much as I can, but there's little Seth uh, taking a little bath in the sink. Oh, boy, he's just so cute. Here's another one. He's uh, got a little shirt on that says, Joy to the World. Here's another one. That's when he was five months old. My wife and I have little pictures that we take with him. Two months, three months, four months, five months, six months. So we can always remember that's those special moments. There's Seth uh, pulling the glasses of my mother's husband, Bill Copperman. And there he is at six months. That was taken just, just a little while ago, not very long. And here's another one on his little, his little uh, he's got a, a lot of little, he's got his walker, he's got his extra saucer. And he's also got his little bouncer. And there he is in his bouncer. And here's one more shot of him. I just love this picture. And there's a verse on the screen, Psalm 139, verse 14, which is from the Bible. And this is the, the words of, of David. And David said, he said, Lord, I will praise you for I am, and what did he say he was? He said, I am fearfully and I am wonderfully made. That's right. Witchcraft, Wicca witchcraft, which so many kids are getting into today, it teaches that there's just a power out there. It's a neutral power. It's not good or bad. It's not positive or negative. It's just a power. And through their, their practices and their techniques, they think they can tap into that power, that energy that comes from nature or from the spirits or from the god and the goddess uh, from Mother Nature, from themselves, wherever it comes from, and they can then channel that power uh, toward good purposes. The, the Bible does not teach that. The Bible says there's two powers. One is good, one is evil. One is uh, perfectly moral, the other is uh, deadly and sinister. And there's no greater event that describes the personal nature of God than his, his willingness to give his own son as a sacrifice for our sins. And when I, when I look at Seth, I mean, this has hit me, this has hit me so strongly. When I think about this little baby, I look at him and I think, you know, he did not come from an impersonal power. He did not come from a power that's out there that's neither positive nor uh, negative. He came and you came and I came from a personal God who made the heaven and the earth, who made you and who made me and who loves us so much that he sent his own son down here to die for us. I mean, that is an unbelievable message that you can't find in any other religion except, except in this book. And Seth's birth has changed me in so many ways. It has taught me more about the personal nature of God's love. And there, and in the midst of all of this, in the midst of all of this, what has impressed me so much is to think, as I think about how much I love my son, I've asked myself, Steve, would I be willing to sacrifice my, my baby for people that maybe don't even care? Would I be willing to do that? And then I realized that that's what God did. God sacrificed his own son. And it hit me one day that God sacrificed his son to save my son. And not only to save my son, but to save me and to save you. And there is no greater revelation of the personal nature and the personal love of God for you and than Jesus giving his life on a cross and being separated from his father so that we could be united with him. Do you understand that? That's the message of the gospel. That's the message of the Bible. And I want you to know with all my heart that God loves you. He loves you with a personal love. He wants you. He gave his son for you. And he wants you to reach out your hand and take a hold of his hand so he can save you forever. We've been talking about Bible prophecy. One of the 
greatest prophecies in the Old Testament pointing forward to Jesus and to our own day is in Zechariah 12, verse 10. The Bible says, I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. And then it says, they will look upon me whom they have pierced. They will look upon me whom they have pierced. God's alternative to witchcraft is the man with the scars. And that man is Jesus Christ. He is God's son. He came in fulfillment of prophecy. There's nobody like him. He's the only one that can satisfy the deepest needs of our hearts. And this verse says that God wants, he wants us to look upon him whom we have pierced. Uh, this has amazed me as I've thought about the Harry Potter series, that Harry also has a scar. When you read the Potter books, you discover that uh, the evil wizard Voldemort tried to kill Harry. He killed his parents, and then he tried to kill Harry, but his death cursed bounced back on him from Harry, the baby Harry, back onto this evil wizard, and it stripped him of his powers, and he went off into the night. And what was left was the scar on the head of this little baby. Uh, Harry Potter, and that's sort of the, the hallmark of this whole story is the scar on his head. There's a statement in the Potter books where a good wizard, uh, Albus Dumbledore, or at least supposedly a good wizard, that's the way the Potter books describe him, Albus Dumbledore comments about the scar that was on Harry's head, and there it is right on the screen. This is from the Sorcerer's Stone, the first Harry Potter book, page 14. Albus said, he will have that scar forever. Harry Potter is totally uh, fantasy. It's totally fiction. And yet this is what people, this is what kids are looking at. They're, they're looking at this boy with a scar. And as I've thought about that, I've thought, isn't that tragic? Isn't that sad? That so many kids are looking to the wrong person with the scar. And isn't that just the way the devil is? He wants to divert us away from God's man that has God's scars and get us to look at somebody else who doesn't even exist. Harry Potter is totally fantasy. He's not even there. He doesn't exist. It's just a, it's just a story. But Jesus Christ really does exist. He really did come down here. He really did suffer for us. He really did die. He really did fulfill prophecies. All of the prophecies in the Bible and Jesus is the real man with the scars. Satan has a counterfeit for every truth of God. And it just saddens me that so many kids are looking to Harry and his scar, and they're not seeing, they're not understanding the real man with the real scars. And God wants us to turn our eyes away from fantasy and fiction that leads in the wrong direction and to look at Jesus and to look at his scars. Uh, as far as we know, that even in heaven and throughout eternity, there will be one reminder of sin, only one, and that is the scars on the hands and maybe from the, the thorns uh, on his head or on his hands or on his feet when he suffered for your sins and for my sins because he loves us so he can take us home. And I just appeal to you to turn away from witchcraft and Wicca and sorcery and uh, false fantasy that leads away from God and to focus your mind on the real man with the real scars who gave everything, everything for you.